we look at schools and look at behavior, the very same surface behavior can oftentimes follow from different issues. In some cases, as we've talked about, it meets desires or needs. I want out of math because I don't desire to look stupid. So I act up and, and I get out. All right? Met my need. All right? I want Lori to talk to me, and so maybe I act like a clown, so I think, so I think I'm cool. Maybe Lori will actually talk to me. Right? We talked about disability. If I've got a child with ADHD or a child with anxiety disorder, okay, that the disability itself can bring various behaviors into play, right? How about culture? Yeah. There's an interesting book out there called Black and White Styles of Conflict. It's it was written in the 80s by a man named Koch, K-O-C-H. It was done in the Chicago area, the research. And I, I like the book because it, 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 it talks about a number of things. And you always got to be careful when you say, you know, like this group does this and this group does that because nobody in that group does all those things. But there are normative behaviors. Now one of the things he talks about in this book is like between African Americans and whites. If I'm a white middle class speaker, what am I supposed to be doing with my eyes as I'm speaking to you? Do I make eye contact the entire time I'm talking, never break? No, I'm just look and break, look, break, look, break. What are you supposed to be doing as a listener? You are supposed to be maintaining eye contact with me. All right? Now according to his research, that's true for white middle class. For African Americans, however, there is no strong desire requirement that the person look when they're listening. I could be involved in something else and still be listening. Okay? I might look at you, but I might not. It doesn't mean I'm listening or not listening. On the other hand, when I speak, I am much more likely to maintain eye contact for a much longer time and actually even be more animated about what I'm saying because it's the effort I put in to show you how much this means to me. That's whether you should believe me or not. So now I just catch, I'm gonna give you two both a gender change. Okay? So I just caught you both doing the same activity. I come in as a teacher and I start ranting and raving. What do I expect you guys to be doing with your eye contact? Looking at me. You're looking at me, you're not. What might I assume? I'm not paying attention. You're not paying attention. Now it's time for me to get done ranting and raving. I want to hear your side of the story. You look, break, look, break, but you look directly at me the entire time you're talking and you're incredibly animated as you're telling me what's going on. How might I say that? Aggressive, arrogant, challenging. It's now my turn to give both of you a consequence for your behavior. Might I give you different consequences? Yeah. Now you weren't listening when I was talking to you, but by God, you're going to listen to me now. Did it have anything to do with the person not listening? No, it was a cultural misinterpretation. Okay. Now is it likely I am going to understand all the nuances of every cultural group that's in my classrooms? No. But we should not be punishing kids for their culture. We should not be punishing kids for their disabilities. I'm not sure we should even be punishing kids because they're trying to get their needs met. Okay. We should be educating them. And one of the big things around doing the FBA is that this allows us to do some education. Okay. And there's one more issue. How many of you have ever had a student who's, let's say, swearing? And you go, okay, I've had enough of this swearing. I'm bringing mom and dad in. We're going to talk about little Billy and his swearing. Mom and dad come in, about three minutes into the conversation, a light goes on. Ah. Ever happen? Yes. It's like, I think I know where this swearing's coming from. This is not little Billy trying to get my attention. This is just that he's learned every fourth word is a swear word. Okay? Habit. Anybody ever try to break a habit here? Is it easy? No. So we have different reasons kids behave, but it's all the same surface behavior. So understanding some of these things, putting some of these things in the equation is very important as we begin to think about how we're going to develop functional assessments. Why are we doing this? Why are we talking to people? And helping teachers and administrators understand this because, again, this is flying in the face of what schools generally do. So we've got to help them understand why we're doing something differently. If a behavior plan, by the way, BIP, does involve somebody who comes from a different cultural group than the, than the, the team, you're supposed to have somebody on that team who can talk about the, any, any cultural implications of this behavior. Now one of the interesting things is that, do any of you have teachers who, or administrators who kind of go, you know, or, or maybe you've even said it yourself, gee, this is just really not fair, this dual system. We do one thing for special education kids and something else for general education kids. Have you ever heard that argument? Yeah, well guess what? In a few years, they may not have this argument about FBAs and BIPs because you know who else is looking at FBAs and BIPs right now? The Office of Equal, uh, um, Equal Educational Opportunity, whatever the title, I get the wrong title. Because we are suspending another group of students at a greater, greater level than one would anticipate. African-American students, especially African-American males. 
So it's likely within the next few years, this will come down as a requirement for all children, not just children with special needs. Boy, then we're going to be in a world of hurt. We can't even keep up with the special education kids right now. It's going to be much more challenging when we have to do it for everyone. But I, I anticipate that it won't be too many years before that's, that, that'll be the case. All right. Moving to the second piece of this, and this is a piece that oftentimes get overlo gets overlooked in, a, in an FBA. Again, the bigger picture. I'm trying to help kids be successful. The best way to deal with behavior, if we go in and look at teachers, so let's say that Sarah here is my new teacher, and Kathy is somebody who's been teaching for a number of years. When Lori acts out, do we see huge differences in how they handle her acting out? When she's in a full-blown panic? Not much. That's not where we see the big differences. It's not once the kid's acting out. Where we see the huge differences is that Kathy is better at preventing Lori's problems than is Sarah. It's the prevention. And the number one aspect in terms of preventing behavior problems generally is academic success. One of the very first questions I ask when, I, when I'm asked to go and look at a child who has behavior problems is, how are they doing academically? If they are not doing well academically, most kids will not fail quietly. So if you're putting me in a situation where I am failing, anticipate my acting out. So if I'm going to have to do something, somebody will always say, as soon as I get Melissa's behavior in order, then by God we're going to start cracking down on this academics. is isn't going to happen. If I don't get the academics in, in check, I am not going to deal with that behavior very effectively. So part of it, the functional assessment should be looking at what's going on with this kid academically. And why are they having problems academically? Where does that fall in? And do the teachers who are working with this child understand where this kid is going? Reading is essential. How many of you deal with high school students? Okay. If you went to your high school biology teacher and said, do you understand? All right, so Kathy, my high school biology teacher, do you know what Michael's reading level is? A regular class? No, they won't know. They don't know. How do I know that if I assign chapter six that this is even a fair thing to assign? They don't have the knowledge. Is that, an, is that an important thing to know? Absolutely. And we know, again, kids are coming in with fewer literacy skills, not more. Yet we're putting more pressure to get these literacy skills. I have a question. I know it's ethical to meet the child where he's at, but say you're, as a biology teacher, you have to get to a chapter. Mm-hmm. Because the administration is telling you modification, modification. Yeah, we're going to talk about a couple of things that we're going to look at that, okay? Yeah, part of the issue that I've got to do is I've got to say, you know, I don't care what the administration is telling me. If, if Kim is reading at the third grade level, and this is reading at the sixth grade level, if I don't find some way to get the material to her at her level, she can't do it. I could set this book in front of her. I could put a million dollars in front of her and say, well, you read that, it's here, this is yours. You know, she can't do it. You can't do it, you can't do it. It's kind of like if I said, you know what, I will, I've got $100,000. If anybody can stand flat-footed right here, jump up and hit this little beam. That money is yours. Would any of you try? <laughs> I'd try. Hell, you never know. You know, it could be a free kind of situation. I might actually hit it, you know. Probably wouldn't jump very long, though, before I realized, you know, I can't do that. Some of our kids have been told day in and day out, whatever it is we do at school, you can't do it. Right? So I've got to somehow find a way to get it to her. And we'll talk about some, some, some options here, some kind of interesting things possibly. Here's one of the, the, one of the websites, this one in, in blue here. What's kind of cool is that if I can cut and paste, if I can you know, like scan my material in. So let's say I'm a teacher. I'm, I'm, I'm on, uh, one of the children on my caseload is in Kathy's biology class. Now I recognize Kathy reads because of this. That's one of the nice things about all these tests that we're doing with kids. I know now that Kathy reads at the third grade, fourth month level. I, I, what I need to do is help the teacher understand where the problem is. I can scan a piece of the literature into this, a part of the chapter, plug it into that website, it will immediately give me the readability of that material. So, okay, the reading material is at 9.2. I can now say, okay, here's 9.2, and he, he, she reads at 3.4, whatever the situation is. We've got a problem. Okay. I can also, I, I use this when I, to develop probes. Let's say I've got a student who comes into my classroom. I want to know what is their mastery level of reading. I can go down to the Learning Center, grab a bunch of books at different levels, scan in, get, and, and make it like paragraph probes. So I've got you know, maybe a three-page little, little material that starts maybe at the first grade level and goes to the eighth grade level at, at half-year half intervals in terms of reading levels. 
I might now sit down with Lori and say, Lori, read the third paragraph. All right, she does it with no mistakes. Read the seventh paragraph, no mistakes. Read the ninth paragraph, mistakes. Read the eighth paragraph, mistakes. Seventh grade, the seventh one, is the seventh paragraph is her, her mastery level. If I am going to assign work that she has to have the knowledge of that material, it better not be higher than that level. Because I better not be assigning acquisition level reading for material I want the kid to learn the material from. Okay? So I can, I can use that information for a number of things. Now we're seeing schools, especially for younger kids, starting to do things. That because reading is, is so critical, that we're trying to get it caught before third grade. So many schools are looking and saying, okay, do kids have things like phonemic awareness? Now, let's talk about kids with hearing impairments. What's going to be a problem here? Oh, that whole issue can be incredibly confusing. So learning how to break the code can be very difficult, especially if I've got some other disabilities linked on top of my hearing impairment. Because we know for decoding, phonemic aware awareness is, is critical. All right? But there's some different measures, and some, some schools are doing these kinds of measures. And then if kids don't meet certain levels, they kind of have a, have a, um, a system where, you know, here's to, this happens to be Project Pride out of Northern Illinois University, but grade level instruction. But if a child hits a certain level of, 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 you know, of lack of skills, they might get some boosters. And if they still, then intensive small group, if that doesn't work, then they go to a different kind of reading instruction. But they have a plan that we're going to identify this, we're going to monitor this because this is so critical the kids have this, that we can't wait until they're in third, fourth, fifth grade and say, ah, oh, damn, too bad, you can't read very well. We gotta catch it early, we gotta catch it in the front end, and make some interventions in place. Maximizing student success. Nothing succeeds like success. Right? Again, if a child's not being successful, don't anticipate them behaving. It's a rare kid. In the reauthorization in 2004, the newest reauthorization, the IDEA, now which is IDEIA, talks about the fact that schools should embrace things called a universal design to instruction, to lessons. Now the best example that I can think of for universal design was when cities went out and cut all the sidewalks, right, at the, at the street level, they put a big gap in, so now the concrete goes and matches the street. Why did we do that? Why did we spend millions and millions of dollars of tax money to do this? People in wheelchairs could have access now to cross the streets. Can only people with wheelchairs use that incline? In fact, most of us use the incline, and most of us don't have a problem. Right? That's universal design. It's like, it's going to be okay for everybody, and we don't care how you cross the street, everybody's got to cross the street. That's what we wanted. With this new law where everybody has to learn, we've got to start helping teachers. And the law allows us, especially for kids with disabilities, to say, it doesn't matter how the kid gets to the table. We just want them at the table in terms of learning. So if you are doing, you know, Tale of Two Cities, I don't care how the kid gets the content for Chapter 5 of Tale of Two Cities. I just want on Thursday when we discuss it, he's got the information to discuss it, period. I don't care if he reads the comic book, watches the movie, reads the book as Dixon, Dick, uh, Dickens wrote it, or gets a, a, an abridged version. I don't care. What we want is for him to have the concept of what Chapter 5 talked about in Dickens, so that we had the class discussion when we has to take that information and use it sometimes later in, in terms of, of other aspects of, of, our, of our cultural growth, he will have that information. Now, these are some websites that, that might help you. You were asking, how can you get some of this stuff? And I think you were, Melissa, in terms of, okay, so he's in the third grade and he's in this class. The first one happens to be, it's called Babelfish. People may be aware of this. This is a language translation program. If I go in, and I, again, I have to be able to scan so I can clip, pull it out, you know, like highlight it and move it. I pump it into Bab Babelfish, it will give me an immediate translation. So if I have kids who English is not their first language, I can now give them a Spanish version of the chapter. I can give them a Polish version, okay? Now the translations are not great, but they're certainly better than English if English is not my primary language. If you are in a middle school or high school, your language people may have shut this off at the school. Sometimes the foreign language people will shut this off so people aren't using this to do their homework for French class. All right? And you have to use a special code to get through there. Okay? 
but, but generally you can use it. All right? And we should be informing our kids about this, especially kids who English is not their first language. Anything they have to read, again, if they can drag it and put it in there, it's going to translate it for them. All right? Now they can get it in their primary language. The second one is called read please. Same thing, if I can, if I can cl cut and paste it, I can pop it in there and it will read it to me. So now if I've got third grade reading, now my comprehension's not a problem. I can cut and paste her sixth grade chapter in, put it into read please, I can choose a male voice, a female voice, and three pitches. And it will read it to me. Not a big deal if you're hearing impaired, but it's a big deal if you're not hearing impaired, okay? <laughs> Cognitive rescaling. This is only good in Microsoft Word. What I can do is go in and I can again highlight whatever's going on and there's a sliding scale. I can say give me a 10% summary. And it will highlight in yellow the 10% most important facts in that material that I just entered into it. I can say I want a 20% summary, a 50% summary. We've tried to get Microsoft to tell us how they do this. They won't. It's a, it's a trade secret. But it actually is pretty good. It doesn't work for, fi for fiction, but any, any non-fiction. It does an excellent job. Okay. So again, if I can scan it, give it on a desk, and, and most of you, if, and I don't know if you're aware of this, if your school is adopting a text, you can generally ask them to give you CD-ROM versions of the textbooks, and they will give them to you for free. If you order them afterwards, they will charge you big bucks for them. Okay, they, they cost them virtually nothing to produce once, they're, once they've done the initial thing. So they give them like crazy when you're, when you're, if they think it's going to help you adopt a textbook. Afterwards, they want big money. Same thing with books on tape. Kidspiration. Some of our kids do not think in lineal fashion, in a linear fashion. <coughs> so writing is a problem because the first sentence has to follow the, or the second sentence has to follow the first, third has to follow the second, and the first, second paragraph has to follow the first paragraph, and that's not how they think. Some of our kids have these racing thoughts. And they can't even keep track of them quick enough to put them down in that way. And so writing becomes incredibly frustrating. It's not the writing aspect, it's the thinking aspect. Kidspiration has both a paid section and a free section. But what it does is it helps you, in there's lots of like graphic organizers, ways that you can plug stuff in, kids can put it in, in the way they're thinking. And then it will help them think about how to put that together in a more meaningful essay or whatever the situation might be. Okay. The last one there is Spark Notes. Remember when we were in school, we had to read Tale of Two Cities? What did you go out and do? <laughs> you went out and bought the Cliff Notes. This is the electronic version of Cliff Notes. Spark Notes has literally hundreds of the popular books that are used in schools. And it's the Cliff Notes electronically. And it's actually broken down. Chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, a subject evaluation. You know, let's look for symbolism in the story. Here's what's in. And it, will, it does all the things Cliff Notes did. Now again, you'll have some kids who cannot read Dickens. But if we're going to do fifth chapter, I can read this and make sense out of it. Now, what will some of your teachers say? That's not fair. Part of our job is helping them realize it doesn't have to be quote unquote fair in terms that everybody does the same thing. It's fair in that everybody gets the information and can bring it in and can all of a sudden now contribute to the lesson. Okay, that's the universal design piece. We have to help teachers become more comfortable with this. Now, my son graduated from Elgin High School as the valedictorian. When I was showing him this particular slide, he says, I knew about most of these things. You're, most of the kids that are doing pretty well at school, this is not new stuff. He was a Spanish minor in, in college. He knew about babblefish long before I ever knew about babblefish. And they're using these suckers. Who doesn't know about them? The, the teachers and the kids who need them, <laughs> right? It's part of that informal curriculum of school that oftentimes the kids who are doing the best have much better access to, to, to the supports and aids and the kids who need them. Yes? There's a program that um, is available to us called Solo, and it has read out loud, write out loud, draft builder, and co-writer. So if you have, I mean, for some of the deaf kids, I mean, obviously the read out loud, but you can do <coughs> anything if you have a program go on the internet and it will read it out loud to you. You can highlight, put it into an outline, it'll build a draft for you. And then the co-writer, the guy who did the presentation and went to said that at Gallaudet they have it at, on their, um, in their library on their computers and it helps anticipate like word order and what word would come next. Cool. So it's just one program and it has a lot of those. Things. And what's the name of it? It's called Solo. It encompasses all four of those programs, but okay. the other one um, is Read Out Loud, Write Out Loud, Draft Builder, and Co-Writer. 
Is it a paid paid site? You know? Yeah. So you have to pay for it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And a lot of our kids could really benefit from different kinds of things that will help them be able to compete and be effective. There's also a website called SignLink. Um, it's being developed. It's not perfect, but you can highlight text anywhere on the internet that you find it, and then go to the link, and the window opens up, and it will sign it. It will sign it to you. Great. Sign link? Okay, that'd be great, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, technology is opening the door for a lot of things. I think in the, in the, in the future, we're going to see even more. Uh, but again, helping our teachers realize that the task is to get everybody at the table. They don't have to come in through the same gate. They can come in through different ways. Part of what we try to do with teachers, and, and if you're, you have a child in your caseload or if you're the teacher, is do you understand the diversity in your own classroom? So I might have issues in terms of here's this is three of the kids in my class, and so we know Jason reads, the, the coding is 4.3, reading comprehension 4.0, Sue is 6.4, 6.2, Frida is 6.9, 6.7. I'm a sixth grade science teacher. I'm going to do a lesson on cell structure. I've got a little five page handout that I'm going to give everybody. They're going to read it silently to themselves. I then have a worksheet we're going to complete in which everybody does different kinds of things. Right? We're then going to have this little activity in which I say, I'm going to point to something in the thing and say, what is this? And you're going to say, oh, that's a vacuole. And you just want to point for your team. And I'll say, Kevin, what does a vacuole do? And Kevin's going to say, oh, well, that stores waste products for the cell. You've got to point for your team. You know, right? and we're going to, that's, that's my lesson plan. And I drop it on this class. What's going to happen? Jason can't do it, right? Now, as most teachers, what am I going to do? So let's say that Lori's Jason. Lori's screwing around. What will the teacher generally come over and do? Reading. Get to work. Come on. He can't do it. Is he going to sit there quietly with his hands folded? No. Probably going to misbehave. Can he do the worksheets? No. Can he do the game? No. No. I, he doesn't have a seat on the bus. So if I can give my teachers some information like this and they work with them at the front end, or if I'm a teacher working on the front end, here's my lesson. Here's the demands. Here's my kids. These three can't do that. But well, what could I have done differently that would have allowed Jason to have a seat on the bus? I could have given him a packet written at a different level. We could have read it orally together. I could have paired people up and so he had a peer that could read it to him. Just because I can't read doesn't mean I can't understand it. I can't read it. Okay, we're going to get one more slide and then we're going to take a break. I lied, two slides. So part of what we want to do is, is identify our lesson. The state has done this for us, what most students should learn. When I teach, what do I want all students to learn? What are the key concepts in this lesson? When you go in and work with your teachers, again, I've got a student who's having trouble. As I listen to them teach, as an observer, can I pick out the key points of this lecture? Because if I can't, the odds are he can't. Okay? I do this with my student teachers. I'll go in and I'll say, I don't want to see your lesson plan beforehand because if I can't tell you what your lesson was, there's a problem. Okay. Did I hit it strongly? Did I hit it across multiple modes in terms of getting the information? Do I know what I want? So how many of you can tell me the phases of meiosis and mitosis? Can you tell I was a science teacher? What are the phases of meiosis and mitosis? Interface, prophase, Our biology teacher. Where are the rest of you guys? All right, where were those? You haven't heard them. What are they? Now, has the quality of your life changed because you did not remember these? No. What now without this biology teacher? What are meiosis and mitosis? Cell division. Why do we have two kinds? Plant and animal. Plant and animal. Wonderful. Uh, wrong, but a wonderful <laughs> guess. Okay? Wonderful guess. That's just wrong. Okay? <laughs> okay? Why do we have two? Yeah, for sex cells, for gametes, and one is for regular cells, right? Because with gametes, sex cells, we only want half the chromosomes. Otherwise, we speed evolution a little too fast. Right? Now, as a science teacher, do you think I care that you didn't remember the phases of meiosis and mitosis? No. Probably not. But I might like you to remember that there were two types of, of cell division. One was for the production of sex cells, one was for the production of regular cells. Did I teach it that way? Or was it just a whole bunch of crap and you had to pick out what was important? Okay. When was the Magna Carta signed? 16. 16, wrong. 
Wrong. What was the Magna Carta? Some document. Some document, because it was signed. It must be a document. Good, good in document. Okay. All right. What was the Magna Carta? First document that began to limit the powers of the king. Okay, so it was kind of the, starting the basis of our democracy. Now, as a history teacher, I might not have cared that you didn't remember 1215. But I would like to know that you remember that this was a situation where we started to limit the powers of the king. Did I teach it that way? All right. Now, that's what I want all kids to learn. State does the middle part. What do I want some kids to learn? Some of us think that's just the gifted kids. But quite frankly, that's not just the gifted kids. I've got Laura, I keep picking on Laura, I'm not gonna pick on Laura anymore. <laughs> Oh, cover up your name. Okay, let's see here. No, she didn't. Gloria. Gloria. Gloria won't do anything. She doesn't take a book out. She doesn't get a gag. She just, just doesn't, she just sits there like a lump. Now, I've gone into teams and said, okay, you guys are my team. We've got to get Lori to do something. She's not doing a damn thing right now. I'll have imaginary money. Here's $100,000. If we can get Lori to do anything, this money is yours. Now, don't think about what you want her to do. Just think about what can you get her to do. You think you could come up with something? Surely. I have yet to have a team who couldn't do this. Now, if Lori's doing, or Gloria's doing nothing, the first thing I've got to do is get Gloria to start doing something. So what I made her do is think about what's possible. What could I get her to do? Now, I was not a great student when I was in high school, but I liked biology. I especially liked genetics. I think it's because it had something to do with sex. I'm not sure. All right? I think somehow that, that figured into my calculation. I'm not sure. When I went home for Christmas break my sophomore year, my biology teacher sent me home with a bottle of ether and a bottle of fruit flies. And I anesthetized fruit flies and bred fruit flies for 32 generations. Now this was not because I was a dynamic student, this was because I was interested and all of a sudden I could go back and present to the class what happens when you breed 32 generations of fruit flies as far as red eyes, brown eyes, straight wings or curly wings. Now every time you anesthetize fruit flies, by the way, what happens? Have anybody do this experiment when you were in high school? And you dump them out, and you got a little paintbrush and a, and a, and a magnifying glass, and you're separating them out by brown eyes, blue eyes, or brown eyes, red eyes, and a few of them wake up early. <laughs> by the time Christmas break was over, our house was full of fruit flies. <laughs> so the day my, day my mother died, she remembered this teacher, not particularly fondly, okay? Although Sister Mary Patrick actually did a nice job. So part of what I've got to do is, am I doing these kinds of things? Am I thinking about how I'm setting my lesson up? And this is the last one before our break. Think about your Russells. If I go from a low F to a high F in your school, is it celebrated? <laughs> if I go from a B to an A, is it celebrated? Does it take more points to go from a low F to a high F? Yeah. All right, think of the Russells. Are they likely to excel academically? No. Can they improve? Mm -hmm. But if you don't acknowledge improvement, why should I bother? We've done this as just an intervention in and of itself. Just start a program in your school that when you get certain number of points increase, it means something good. And we've actually changed kids' outcomes significantly by doing this. You don't need permission from your administrators. You could go back tomorrow and start doing this in your school of having an acknowledgement in your classroom for kids who do better. We've got schools who have dean's lists or principal's lists. You get a certain grade point average, you get this little 13 cent certificate and your name goes on a bulletin board. We've had schools that have done academic achievement awards now. You get so many point move, you also get a 13, 13 cent certificate in your name on a bullet. But now you're still flunking, but you're flunking better than you were last year. <laughs> right? We don't call it student improvement because that says you're dumb and you're not quite making it, but, you know, but, but some kind of a title that, that allows kids to do things. But we've got to attack those academic pieces. You're not going to get behavior under control if you don't take as part of that functional assessment taking an issue of saying, where is the kid at academically, and what things are going on in the, in the environment that are keeping this kid from being successful academically. Otherwise, oftentimes you're going to be barking up a, a, a really tough tree trying to change behavior in spite of f academic failure. All right, let's take a break. Uh, let's take 10 minutes, and we'll come back and we'll start talking about behavior. Bathrooms on both, both ways. <laughs>